Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Ryan Tedford from the Medical University of South Carolina. And behalf on the ISHLT and my co-moderator uh, today, Rachna Kataria from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, very pleased to welcome everyone to the ISHLT Cardiology Professional Community Webinar. Uh, we have four outstanding talks today about my favorite ventricle, hashtag the people's ventricle. Uh, talking uh, about the RV uh, with heart failure, uh, left ventricular assist devices, transplant, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. I do want to share a couple of logistics uh, with you. Uh, first of all, we'd ask that you stay muted throughout the webinar. Uh, questions will certainly come up as you hear these outstanding talks, and I'd ask you to put those questions in the chat. Uh, as time allows, we will uh, try to get the answers to those questions um, after each talk. There's also a post-webinar survey that you'll receive, and we ask that you fill that out, uh, be as honest and brutal as possible so we can improve the experience moving forward. Uh, this uh, session is also being recorded. Uh, we have an ISHLT, uh, ISHLT YouTube uh, channel, uh, and you can uh, view this these talks over and over again uh, on that YouTube channel. And then finally, this is one in a series of web webinars sponsored by the ISHLT. Uh, the next one is in pediatrics on February 3rd. Uh, so hopefully uh, you will attend uh, that one and, and many more to come. So with that, I'd like to turn things over again to my co-chair, Dr. Kataria, and she's gonna introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Dr. Tepper, for the introductions. Uh, so to start us off today, we have the amazing Jonathan Grinstein. Dr. Grinstein is at the University of Chicago, and he'll be talking to us about the diagnostics and therapeutics for RV failure. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, we are going exactly as Rashma mentioned, we are going to just first discuss some of the emerging diagnostic uh, tools to help uh, identify patients with a struggling right ventricle and some best practices and therapeutics to help manage the right ventricle to help get them ready for any downstream surgical therapies. Here are my disclosures. And here's the agenda. We'll start talking about some of the kind of current predictive tools out there and the limitations of the risk scores that are currently in common use. And we'll then discuss some of the emerging advanced hemodynamic and echocardiographic parameters that might improve our diagnostic and prognostic yield moving forward. We'll then shift gears and focus on the best practices of managed right ventricle. And to understand how to best manage right ventricle, we need to understand the unique physiological principles of the right ventricle and discriminate it from the left ventricle. And with that in mind, let's get into it. So to tell a story as complex as the right ventricle, I like to start at the end of the story so we all understand why this is such an important problem and then go back to the beginning and figure out how to solve the problem. So here you can see how devastating, uh, at least in terms of post-operative RV failure after an LVAD, how devastating RV failure is. In purple, you can see severe RV failure designed, defined as an ion duration of greater than 21 days. And an orange acute severe RV failure uh, defined as the need for an RVAD uh, or prolonged uh, inhaled inotropes. 
uh, and or and uh, uh, vasodilators. And you can see that if somebody has either severe or acute severe RV failure, survival of the two years is only around 30 to 40 percent. And when you look at the common the combined endpoint of survival, uh, free of heart failure admissions or GI bleeding, only about 20% of patients make it to two years without one of these events. And this is not just a problem of the old generation of LVADs. This is a problem in their current versions as well. Here you can see the two-year Momentum 3 data. And numerically, right heart failure was actually higher in the HeartMate 3 population than it was in the HeartMate 2 population, although it did not reach statistical significance. And when you look at the most recent five-year data, and you look at focus on the bottom line, these are late uh, rates of uh, right heart failure in the highlighted square right here. And statistically, RV failure is actually worse in the HeartMate 3 population than it is in the HeartMate 2. And if you look at the slide here, this is the only LVAD-specific comorbidity that is actually getting worse, not better, with the current era of technology. So how can we identify and prevent RV failure? Well, there have been dozens and dozens of attempts. On the left, you can see some of the maybe more well-known uh, risk scores, but all of these, even the CRIT score in blue, has an area under the curve uh, of, or a C statistic of only around 0.7. On the right, you can see one of the more uh, novel or emerging risk scores. I wouldn't even say emerging at this point. I think it's well-validated at this point. It's the Euro. Uh, max uh, right heart failure risk score. And you can see the components that go into it. It's always a combination of clinicals, hemodynamics, and echocardiographic variables. And then there's a, a variant of the Euro piece, uh, sorry, the Euro max score that includes an intraoperative cardiopulmonary bypass time. As we all know, there are many unmeasured variables that occur in the operating room that lead to postoperative RV dysfunction that are hard to quantify preoperatively. Even when you put these together, we're still, again, looking at areas under the curve to predict postoperative RV failure of only around 0.7. So how can we improve? What, what, what tools are out there to improve our, our, our yield, our prognostic yield uh, for postoperative RV failure? Well, echocardiography, I would say not the uh, ideal modality, certainly not in isolation, but maybe we've been looking at the wrong variable. So rather than just looking at a qualitative or a semi-quantitative assessment of our function, we're now finding newer tools. For the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into a lot of these. I'm just gonna highlight some of the ones that are um, have a little bit more of an evidence-based uh, literature uh, out there. These include fractional area change, which looks at the difference in area of RV and end compared to end athlete. The myocardial performance index, which um, calculates the amount of time um, uh, during ejection and compares that to the amount of time that your cut the valve is closed. Strain obviously is becoming more and more standard of care and, and uh, can be easily automated in most labs. And then the uh, ratio of the short axis of the RV to the long axis of the RV. Again, the caveat here is none of these uh, are ready for prime time in isolation and we need more prospective studies to see if these can be added to other diagnostics, including hemodynamics and clinicals, to improve um, uh, uh, risk scores moving forward. Hemodynamics was the focus of this talk. So what data do we have to, uh, uh, to use hemodynamics to help support a right ventral that is going to struggle? Well, let's start with the, you know, the different phenotypes of cardiogenic shock. The cardiogenic shock working group has given us a lot of data about an RV dominant phenotype of shock on the left and different uh, hemodynamic thresholds to suggest that the right ventricle might be struggling with their current level of support uh, and, and thresholds to either escalate or de-escalate support. As you can see, the, the numbers on the screen are all over the place, and that's because they've been studied in different patient populations, which is an overall theme of why hemodynamics sometimes um, uh, lose a forest through the tree when you're trying to interpret hemodynamics. The important thing to remember here is not so much the individual thresholds of the numbers, it's when a right ventricle is struggling, you can't eject blood efficiently and the CVP begins to rise and the LV pressures begin to drop because the RV is struggling to fill the left ventricle. So the ratio of the RA to wedge pressure will start to rise. I would say any value above 0.63, regardless of the context, whether it's post LV, post MI, shouldn't really matter. If it's above 0.63, you should take this right ventricle a little bit more seriously and do some more provocative tests, which we'll get to in a second. And as the PAPI drops below, certainly less than 1.85, but I would even argue less than two, this patient needs a, a little bit more of an investigation of the right ventricle. So when you look at the advanced hemodynamic parameters, so not just simple RA, but some of the com combined terms that take into account both output and congestion simultaneously, 
we're starting to see a little bit more of a signal for truly prognostic parameters. Here, this is all the way back in 2016. PAPI was the most discriminatory. PAPI of less than 1.85 uh, had a nice discriminatory ability to predict post-operative artery failure after LVAD implantation, followed uh, not too far behind uh, by RV stroke work index and the RA to ratio. But we're beginning to realize that maybe a static assessment of hemodynamics doesn't tell the whole story. So I'm going to show three different groups. First is actually Dr. Tedford's group that uh, gave nitroprusside to patients preoperatively. And you can see uh, that, uh, that the stroke volume index, either baseline stroke volume index, peak stroke volume index, or the delta, the change in stroke volume index, helped predict uh, those who would subsequently develop post-operative RV uh, failure. But the most predictive was the peak stroke volume index after nitroprusside. And for those who are able to augment stroke volume index above 22.1, the rates of post-operative RV failure were far less than those who were unable to augment uh, their stroke volume index. Similarly, Cacioli et al. Uh, used nitroprusside again, uh, but this time they looked at uh, post-nitroprusside PAPI. And the addition of the post-nitroprusside PAPI uh, to uh, pre-existing risk scores, including the Euromax and CRIT, helped improve the C statistic there. And then our group, uh, instead of using nitro nitroprusside, we used milrinone uh, preoperatively. We loaded patients with milrinone. And after the milrinone uh, load, uh, patients who had a drop in their RA pressure, a drop in their PA diastolic pressure, or an augmentation in the stroke volume index, similar to what Ted, uh, Ryan and uh, Tefford showed, uh, also had fewer rates of RV failure. So summarizing everything on the screen here, it might not be the static assessment of human genetics that are as um, uh, uh, provocative or as um, 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 uh, able to predict uh, future events. Maybe it's the dynamic changes. It's said another way, maybe it's how much myocardial reserve the right ventricle has that truly predicts post-operative events. So let's shift gears and let's focus now on the physiology of the right ventricle, which will be a prelude to best practices to manage and optimize the right ventricle. So, there are several unique uh, properties of the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. In red, you can see the right ventricular end diastolic pressure volume relationship is shifted down and to the right compared to the left ventricular end diastolic pressure volume relationship. So said another way, for a, a similar change in preload, the pressure will rise less in the right ventricle than it will in the left ventricle. You can also see that there are differences in the shapes of the pressure volume curves. On the right, you can see the PV loop of the right ventricle is triangular, or it's more rectangular for the left ventricle. The stroke work, which is the area contained within the PV loop itself, is around 25% of the value of the right, in the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. And the myocardial oxygen consumption of the right ventricle is about half that of the left ventricle. What about afterload? So you can see here that with incremental increases in afterload, there is a more precipitous drop in stroke volume and cardiac output for the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. So putting the last three slides together, the right ventricle is exquisitely sensitive to afterload, but actually very forgiving of preload. And this is important to remember when we think about managing the right ventricle. And the last unique property that we have to talk about is the concept of ventricular interdependence. And this is the concept that the size, shape, and compliance of one ventricle, here the right ventricle, influences the shape, uh, the size, shape, and compliance of the left ventricle. And if the right ventricle dilates because of external forces through the pericardium, or if the RV dilates uh, because uh, forcing the right ventricle causes the septum to shift leftward, that's going to compromise the performance of the left ventricle and vice versa. And this is this perfect storm of uh, changes to preload, afterload, and ventricular interdependence occurs when an LVAD is implanted. So normally, before the LVAD is implanted, the right ventricle in 1A is dependent mostly on longitudinal and septal forces to generate its squeeze, with a much lesser dependence on uh, free wall forces. After the LVAD is implanted, the septal forces are oftentimes compromised because of the surgery itself, maybe because the septum has been pulled leftward because you have too much unloading of the LV, or just because of the stresses in, that occur in the operating room itself. And when this happens, the right ventricle is more dependent on longitudinal forces if it's able to recruit these. And if it can't recruit this, the end systolic pressure volume relationship or the contractility of the RV will decrease and the patient will struggle. 
Okay, so how do we manage right ventricle now that we are all experts in the unique pathophysiology of the RV? So the first step is to get your patient out of RV shock. And some people refer to the mechanism um, of progressive RV failure as the RV death spiral. Regardless of a mechanism that tips somebody into RV failure, you know, and in our world of you know post um, uh, post LVAD and post transplant, obviously surgery itself is the biggest uh, uh, instigator of RV failure. But regardless of the mechanism, when the RV begins to struggle, we have a drop in contractility and we have a rise in pulmonary afterload uh, as compensatory mechanisms. And this leads to RV dilation. Uh, as the RV dilates, wall tension uh, and, and, and myocardial demand of the right ventricle increases from Laplace's law. We'll get into that in a second. And there are structural changes in the right ventricle, usually around the tricuspid valve annulus, that can lead to functional regurgitation. In combination, this further leads to the progressive RV dysfunction and underfilling of the left ventricle. And obviously, this cycle continues as the RV gets progressively weaker and weaker. This cycle continues. But then, as the RV, sorry, as the LV becomes underfilled, it then can compromise ejection of blood into the aortic root and will compromise uh, coronary blood flow, specifically right coronary artery blood flow, which leads to a reduction of RV perfusion. So you enter this cycle where RV demand goes up and up and up, and RV perfusion gets progressively worse, and the patient eventually um, dies from, from RV failure. So step one is identifying what tips your patient into RV failure. Here's a big list of different things that can happen in all comers of RV failure. The ones maybe more specific to the post-surgical patients are RV infarcts, usually related to air embolism in the operating room, intraoperative arrhythmias, blood loss in the OR, the anesthesia, or the, even the surgeon's hands nippling the right ventricle can stress the right ventricle. And obviously intraoperative hypoxia and hypotension can tip the right ventricle over. So identify the cause and correct it if you can. And then it's all about trying to maximize preload, or sorry, sorry I take that back, maximize uh, perfusion uh, and minimize uh, demand on the right ventricle. So here are our therapeutic targets. Preload optimization is kind of the, the part and parcel of management in the uh, ICU to try to get the RV either ready for surgery or to get it out of RV failure after surgery. We want to initially aim for a more intermediate, intermediate filling pressure with a CBP of around 10 to 15. Later on, as the right ventricle has a chance to uh, reverse remodel, you can uh, aim for lower filling pressures, but early on, you need a little bit of preload, otherwise the RV is going to struggle to eject, and not too much preload, otherwise wall tension goes up. So an intermediate CBP decreases wall tension and can restore in a neutral septal position to maximize ventricular interdependence. We talked about how extremely sensitive the RV is to afterload. So pulmonary vasodilators, either direct pulmonary vasodilators or systemic pulmonary vasodilators or inodilators such as norinone uh, can be useful in, in, in this context to have decreased demand. We want to increase the delivery of oxygen-rich blood to the right ventricle. So maintaining a good coronary perfusion pressure is, ad is adamant, so is very important. So a NAP of greater than 65 is usually the target we like to achieve. Again, this delivers oxygen-rich blood to the right ventricle and can restore a, set, a neutral septal position. You can actually shift the septum from a left position back to a neutral position by increasing systemic vascular resistance. Inotropes are usually bad for the right ventricle. They're bad for any ventricle, obviously. It increases demand and, work, uh, and myocardial oxygen consumption, which is what I said from the very beginning is what we're trying to minimize here. But sometimes we don't have a choice. We don't want to just save the right ventricle. We want to save the, the patient. And if we um, uh, are in a low output state and our brain and the rest of our body aren't getting the perfusion they need, we do need to add inotropes, even though it is going to increase, increase workload of the right ventricle because we need to be able to deliver blood to the body. Apologize there. For our intubated patients, we want to have a strategy that minimizes PEEP, as PEEP can uh, increase demand on the right ventricle. I mentioned that as the RV begins to struggle, it dilates and stroke volume become, becomes fixed and dilated to its maximum potential. If a patient is still in a low output state and their stroke volume cannot be recruited any further, we have to think about increasing uh, the pacing rate, either with uh, medications, chronotropic agents, or with pacing devices. To, have, to help improve cardiac output. Right ventricle does not like uh, atrial tachyarrhythmias, doesn't like both the rate component and doesn't like the lack of atrial kick. So an aggressive upfront strategy uh, to cardiovert either chemically or electrically is uh, usually uh, the right approach. And then obviously if someone's in deep shock 
You want to think about mechanical devices to fully unload the right ventricle. And if you're thinking about it, you should do it early up front. MCS for the right ventricle is better than delayed provisional use of devices. I'm not going to go into this slide in detail. This basically touches upon everything we said there, but in a little bit more detail. And this is for your reference for later. But I did want to quickly talk about some of the key features that we talked about there, preload, afterload, uh, and coronary perfusion. So this explains the physiology of why preload management is so important to the right ventricle. Wall tension from Laplace's law is directly proportional to the transmural pressure of the radius. Both get better as you diurese, which decreases wall tension and demand for the right ventricle. We talked about afterload and how the RV is exclusively sensitive to afterload reduction. We're going to have uh, much more discussion on this in subsequent talks, but here are the three targets of our therapies that we can uh, deliver. We can block the endothelial receptor, we can deliver nitric oxide, or we can deliver prostacyclins. And we talked about coronary perfusion and how important that is to improve uh, supply to a struggling right ventricle. There is some data in animal models, less so in humans, but potentially phenylephrine and vasopressin might be the unique agents to choose in this context of more pure RV failure. Here you can see that phenylephrine was able to restore RV perfusion and restore cardiac output. And there's some data that there's an alpha adrenergic switch in RV failure that leads to phenylephrine being not just depressor, but also a weak RV inotrope in this context. And vasopressin has a, a unique role in that it increases SVR, but does not increase PVR. So it has a nice ability to restore R RCA perfusion without compromising pulmonary vascular resistance. The very last slide, again, mostly as a placeholder, because I think we're going to talk about this more in subsequent talks, is uh, the different uh, tools we have at our disposal if we are thinking about mechanical support for the right ventricle. These are all the FDA-approved devices. Again, if you're thinking about it, upfront use um, in the OR is preferred over delayed professional use of MCS. So as a quick final slide in summary, our goal here is to minimize demand and, and uh, maximize delivery of oxygen-rich blood. We want a MAP goal of greater than 65, maybe preferentially using uh, uh, phenylephrine and vaso given their unique properties. We want to reduce afterload and reduce preload to decrease the demand on the right ventricle. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you uh, very much for just a really fantastic overview to set the stage for our next three lectures. I think we'll move right into the next uh, lecture, and it's my um, privilege to introduce Livia Goldrich from Brazil who's going to be talking to us about uh, right ventricular failure in heart transplantation, getting it right. Uh, Olivia, thanks so much for being with us, and we look forward to your talk. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Such a great learning opportunity. I'm a heart failure and transplant cardiologist joining you from Porto Alegre in the very south of Brazil. I'll be talking about RV failure in heart transplantation. These are my disclosure slides, none related to this presentation. And we'll shortly begin with a clinical case of a 43-year-old male with familial dilated cardiomyopathy that comes in for transplant assessment. He has biventricular dysfunction, but on echocardiogram, his RV appears only moderately reduced. And on clinical exam and biomarkers, he doesn't appear to be in a lot of right-sided heart failure. In the lab, his baseline hemodynamics show a low output with elevated filling pressures, PVR of 5, and some degree of RV failure. Post nightbride challenge, his TPG drops to 10, with the PVR coming down nicely to 2.5 while maintaining a systolic blood pressure of 85, just feeding our longstanding established thresholds for pre transplant assessment. We then went ahead and transplanted this patient with a size match male donor, but unfortunately, he developed severe RV dysfunction and vasoplegia, requiring VA ECMO for 48 hours. So could we have better predicted or prevented RV dysfunction in this case? We all recognize that RV failure is a well-known strong marker of adverse prognosis in several therapeutic settings of heart failure mostly due to its systemic consequences and interorgan crosstalk. But while heart transplant remains the only available treatment for most patients with advanced heart failure and severe RV dysfunction, the impact of degrees of recipient RVD on heart transplant outcomes haven't been really that, that much explored. 
I brought here perhaps the most relevant study addressing this question, which is from the groups of Turin and Bologna, in which they, uh, in the study, they categorized their heart transplant recipients with RV dysfunction according to their baseline poppy below 1.65 and severe RVD as below one. What they observed was that poppy was a strong uh, was strongly associated with one year post transplant mortality, with some of these patients with severe RVD having a prohibitive mortality above eighty percent. Moreover, recipients with RV dysfunction had a similar one year mortality regardless of a PVR status of higher or lower than three suggesting that not only RV dysfunction by PAPI is a strong marker of longstanding heart failure with chronic multi-organ dysfunction, which may persist after transplant, but also that PVR underestimation may further uh, uh, lead to a higher risk in these patients. So in this sense, we could consider that the occurrence or progression of RV dysfunction could be an additional element to timely list and or eventually prioritize patients for transplant. When we switch subjects a bit to the pre-existing pulmonary hypertension as one of the major risk factors for post-transplant allograft RV dysfunction, we can observe that recipient PVR has decreased over time across transplant eras in the ICHLT registry. But despite that, it has remained a continuous significant risk factor for both one and five year mortality with cutoff values for increased risks such as 2.1 to 2.5, uh, 2.2 wood units, which are actually lower than our uh, guideline uh, recommendations and cutoffs. Numerous studies have already confirmed this association of PVR with transplant outcomes and that it remains uh, robust, but perhaps uh, more so. Uh, some of these uh, variables, uh, more, more so than other variables of the pulmonary vasculature. This is an important work from Dr. Ted Ford with the UNOS database that showed that elevated PVR remains a strong predictor of death, even in recipients with lower PA pressures, considering a mean uh, PA lower than 25, as in the uh, WHO classification. We're all uh, actually very familiar with our recommendations for pre-transplant assessment for pre-existing uh, pulmonary hypertension, and they haven't really changed in the just published updated guidelines. We're also aware that no single test can accurately predict outcome, but together these evaluations are certainly useful for risk stratification. But the truth is that these PA thresholds might be a bit confusing to use in clinical practice, and we always feel that we might be missing patients at risk for severe RV dysfunction. If we are then aware that there is an increased risk if PVR is elevated, regardless of PA pressures, why don't we eventually just simplify our algorithms to look at PVR alone as a rule for phase of challenging? I just wanted to be a bit provocative in this sense. But certainly, and unfortunately, normal pre-op PVR does not rule out the potential for increased PVR and acute RVD after transplant. And our longstanding established thresholds may incompletely assess PA load and RV coupling. And in this sense, other variables of the pulmonary vasculature have been uh, explored and may refine the risk of prediction for allograft RVD. Perhaps the most studied so far is the diastolic pressure gradient but there are controversial findings and several caveats to its clinical use. And the most probably are, uh, promising are probably PA elastance and PA compliance, as well as measures of RV-PA coupling, as they might be earlier markers of pH to better uh, refine uh, risk stratification, particularly in those recipients with uh, pre-existing RV dysfunction. But certainly more studies are needed uh, in our patient population. Going back to our clinical case, it is possible then to uh, state that we may have undercaptured the pH-related risk just by following uh, strictly the guidelines, and we should have observed that PA compliance and PA license didn't really improve much post nipride to perhaps consider a different treatment pathway for this patient. It might be redundant to say, but we can't always assume that combined pH is all from heart failure. And it's important that uh, to reinforce that identifying precapillary causes is not only relevant to assess pre-transplant candidacy and risk, 
but also to optimize their specific therapies as an opportunity to further reduce the risk of RV dysfunction post-transplant. And is there a role for pre-transplant optimization? That again is acknowledged by our recent guidelines and is based on the concept of vasodilatory conditioning with medical therapy that if effective should then be maintained until transplant. It is important uh, to periodically reassess with bright heart cats to make sure uh, that the effects of therapy are uh, maintained and to remember that these patients, uh, although they have reached targets, they remain at significant risk for acute RVD and require intensive management after transplant. If that all fails, then considerations for MCS, particularly LVADs, are required. But what happens uh, if allograft RVD occurs? We indeed know that RV dysfunction occurs in nearly all patients at a different level of severity, and it continues to be a major cause of early morbidity and mortality post-transplant, although granular data on RV dysfunction as a cause of death is challenging to tease out from registries and cohort studies. The diagnosis is done by direct visualization, TE, and hemodynamics in the trans-op or in the immediate post-op period, but we have to keep in mind that this is a rapidly evolving condition, and we might uh, be eventually misled by the images of a hyperdynamic RV that sometimes uh, even looks indeed better than the LV, and by the time the chest is closed or the patient gets to ICU, he's already crashed. So in, uh, it's also to, important to mention that in addition to recipient factors with pre-existing hypertension as the most relevant and which uh, has been the focus of this talk so far, certainly several donor and transplant characteristics are also key and won't be addressed due to time constraints. When we are faced with allograft RV dysfunction, the goals of therapy are to maintain coronary perfusion while optimizing RV preload and reducing afterload by decreasing PVR. But it's also important to limit pulmonary vasoconstriction to favorable uh, ventilatory settings, as Jonathan has already mentioned. Ideally, the management of RVD should start with careful pre-op planning. And there's also a trend, a contemporary trend to over-treatment, particularly with more liberal use of inhaled NO. And it's also important to be aggressive as RV can potentially recover fully if adequately treated. So let's not give up our patient. There is no single best approach to RV dysfunction, but usually key elements are to maintain an adequate CVP, not too high and not too low, to ensure a heart rate above 90 to 100 and sometimes even a bit higher than that, decrease PVR with pulmonary vasodilators of our uh, experience, and not to delay MCS considerations. And if MCS uh, is required, then uh, usually our VADs with Centrimag or Proctec Duo are frequently used. But to simplify for many centers, VA ECMO might be a pretty good option. And we can recall that our heart transplant recipients have indeed one of the best outcomes when compared to patients treated with VA ECMO for cardiogenic shock for other arteriologists. So in conclusions, it is important to mention that pre-transplant RV dysfunction as assessed by PAPI is a strong predictor of post-transplant mortality, that elevated recipient PVR remains a strong predictor of post-transplant outcomes even in the setting of lower PA pressures supporting contemporary pH classifications. That assessment of the PA load, PA load and RVPA coupling might further refine the risk certification of allograft RV dysfunction particularly in those recipients with underlying pre-existing RV uh, dysfunction uh, before uh, transplant. It is also important to mention that post-transplant RVD is nearly ubiquitous at different levels of severity, and it's associated not only with recipient, but also with donor and transplant characteristics, and that considerations for pre-transplant optimization, careful pre-op planning, over-treatment, and aggressive management are warranted. Thank you very much for your attention. Olivia, that was uh, truly outstanding. All this talk about the RV has got me super excited. Uh, I, I think we have time for maybe one question, um, and I'll skip the one that I asked, uh, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that later. 
There, are, there's a question about peripheral or central VA ECMO for primary graft failure. How do you all uh, manage that down in Brazil? So that, that's always a great question, and uh, usually comes to uh, mostly to uh, surgical preferences, and also usually how the surgery is doing. Uh, if there's a chance that the patient is uh, bleeding and they might need to uh, leave like some packages and so on, they might consider like central VA ECMO, but uh, we have uh, moved to peripheral uh, VA ECMO in, in uh, most uh, patients if we can. Uh, we are, there's always the concern with uh, after loading the, the LV, but usually these patients, they won't be on ECMO for too long and not in uh, uh, such high flows uh, if there's only or primarily RV dysfunction. So we usually can we usually can get around uh, even without having to uh, unload uh, mechanically the LV. Excellent. Very good. Uh, Dr. Katari, you want to introduce our next speaker? Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Goldrich. <laughs> our next speaker is a dear friend, mentor, and collaborator of mine, Dr. Jaime Hernandez Montfort. He is at Baylor Scott and White Health in Austin, Texas, and he'll be speaking to us about managing RV failure in LVAT patients. Thanks, Jaime. Thank you, Rock. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And it's an honor to be here, be part of the uh, uh, team presenting today. Um, my focus on the talk is going to be the approach of rack heart failure across the durable uh, VAT spectrum, some of these closures. Um, today, we're going to try to review the burden and pathophysiology of right heart failure after LVAD, discuss diagnostic approaches and longitudinal management options, postulate pragmatic or programmatic considerations that can help mitigate right heart failure after LVAD, and also uh, present future directions to prevent and or anticipate right heart failure after durable VAD, which is a common problem. I think it all starts from the from the beginning in the sense that early referral impacts uh, our expectations of transitions. And um, as we take care of patients with advanced heart disease and we deep phenol profile them uh, through multimodality imaging, hemodynamics, and if needed, um, uh, endomyocardial biopsy to try to dissolve that heterogeneity of presentation, we are always looking for longitudinal well being and native heart survival. However, a lot of these patients will require heart replacement therapies in the form of VAD or transplant. And in that context, um, this is our current days in the office. And I'll start uh, with a case, a 25-year-old male with uh, a history of arrhythmia, AFib, uh, WPW with ablations in the past, um, heart failure with reduced CF uh, after CRT and this guideline-based medical therapy, had a recent inter-admission for low output heart failure, and was transitioned to inotropic support. Um, there was uh, a preserved right heart function reported on the MRI pre milrinone and pre device therapy, and hence uh, underwent LVAD evaluation due to uh, BMI that was prohibitive and a recent history of smoking. The interdisciplinary team approved him as an Intermax 3. Um, and as you can see, that's the preoperative echo, the hemodynamic profile prior to surgery. Uh, we bring patients usually about 24 to 48 hours before surgery, and we see bilateral uh, elevation or elevation of um, right and left heart loading conditions with an abnormal uh, pulmonary artery pulsatility index, despite milrinone. And hence, the decision is made to uh, place a PA catheter, place an intraortic balloon pump to improve or uh, with the attempt to improve uh, uh, these loading conditions, diaries the patient, and goes to the OR the next day. So we'll go back to this case as we move along. And at the moment in the United States, the only uh, available durable VAT option is HeartMate 3. And we rely on the Momentum 3 trial um, to expect or anticipate complications. We know that the overall survival of uh, uh, HeartMate 3 as compared to HeartMate 2 has been uh, 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 proven. However, when we look at cause-specific mortality, uh, we continue to see um, that uh, um, uh, heart failure-related events, and particularly right heart failure-related events, have not changed. And as Dr. Greenstein uh, has eloquently shown, this is really an ongoing uh, uh, problem that 
really postulates a lot of um, uh, perspectives on decision making and how to prevent and or mitigate this condition. We're not going to go over this in detail, but um, right heart failure perhaps uh, is a uh, 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 consequence of um, the series of events that occur uh, after uh, persistent high left heart loading conditions. And as we talked about the sensitivity to afterload and preload in the right ventricle, these are going to become important considerations as we move along in the preoperative and preoperative management of these patients. The proposed pathophysiology of right heart failure after LVAD is typically that we understand that within a dilated left ventricle with a, a low cardiac output and a right shifted septum, there's gonna be a transition in which increased cardiac output uh, that follows LVD compression and a left shifted septum will increase RV preload. And whether excess LVAD speed, residual hypervolemia or uncontrolled blood pressure, increased afterload as mentioned before, um, can cause RV dilatation, worsen TR, and eventually right heart failure. Hence, importantly, preoperatively and postoperatively, early LVAD speed optimization, volume optimization, and blood pressure control becomes very important. And it's upon us as programs uh, to present the opportunities of access and access uh, um, to provide this set of uh, interventions after the pump is placed. There are, in the context of preoperative effects, uh, many other considerations, including uh, the surgery in itself, uh, in which median sternotomy uh, can alter the contractile properties of the RV, hypotension, the need for uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, coronary interventions or the fact that cabbage grafts or collaterals can be injured, the cardiopulmonary bypass running itself and the volume uh, shifts and, and resuscitation efforts uh, that uh, in addition to vasoplegia, of course, also challenges the right heart function. So it's not only the pump in itself, but the preoperative effects that we can uh, encounter in, this, in these settings. When we look at clinical features, I think this article uh, uh, eloquently describes clinically, laboratory, echocardiographic, and of course, invasive hemodynamics that are associated with right heart failure after LVAD, such as female gender, use of interiotic balloon pump, mechanical uh, ventilation, renal replacement therapy, and high dose of inotropes uh, uh, or high inotrope vasoactive index. Of course, surrogates of right heart congestion, such as abnormal renal and uh, liver function, and all the echocardiographic features that we have uh, uh, learned that is not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively, uh, showing right heart dysfunction. From our perspective, we try to really respect hemodynamics and in the context of high uh, RA pressure, abnormal CVP and P, uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure ratio, a low PAPI and a, a low RV stroke port index are all of concern going into the OR. And I think we try to optimize this uh, uh, as much as we can so we can reduce as much as possible the possibility of right heart dysfunction. So in that context, management considerations become importantly in the, uh, important in the preoperative setting, reducing preload, afterload, and uh, trying to increase contractility of the right heart. Intraoperatively, again, ca minimizing cardiopulmonary bypass time, preoperative bleeding, blood product transfusions, um, optimize pump speed during the operating room and dynamically in the first 24, 48 hours. And um, uh, again, considerations in this context of uh, minimally invasive approaches have been also uh, discussed uh, for this type of, uh, um, to minimize the risk. And postoperatively, there's a lot of work to be done to, to best study these systematically and understand uh, uh, the right uh, set of interventions, but a lot of them have to do with the physiology that has been explained before preload optimization, inotropy, chronotropy, PVR management, optimizing systemic MAP and pump speed to maintain perfusion. And again, across that toolbox that has been uh, uh, previously described, the use of diuretics, pulmonary vasodilators, inotropes, adjustment of the pacemaker, and if needed, utilization of temporary mechanical circulatory support, um, uh, whether it's percutaneous and uh, in some cases surgical. 
But if we step back and ask the question, what is right heart failure after LVAD? Well, right heart failure after LVAD in this particular uh, patient was uh, pretty much seeing him after postoperative day one with an ASARCA, renal and liver injury, high inotrope vasoactive index, already in a fluorosomal infusion with a very high RA pressure and initially noted very high um, uh, uh, revolutions per minute, very high speed on ICU post arrival. Um, so when we look at all the definitions of early and late right heart failure, I think that has been noted that there's a strong uh, heterogeneity or, or, or variability in how we define that. I think when we care for these patients, we know when, it, when it's there, like in this particular case, but it's important to have a systematic approach in order for us to learn from registries, from real world data, and of course, postulate interventions that can reduce the risk and uh, avoid, if possible, uh, early acute right heart failure, early post implant right heart failure, or late right heart failure, as uh, 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 Dr. Formos and the uh, writing group um, uh, have eloquently described um, uh, in the context of uh, understanding that right heart failure is not only in the early post-op uh, or in the really intra-op setting, but it follows a continuum of care that requires the same sort of um, um, approaches in terms of uh, hemodynamically, clinically, and imaging interventions and tailored interventions that our patients need of uh, um, preload, afterload, uh, blood pressure, diuretic optimization. When we think about right heart uh, temporary mechanical support options, um, again, uh, we have uh, multiple uh, VA ECMO, uh, we have Protect Dual, uh, Impel RP, and the Spectrum cannula. In addition to that, we have the possibility of uh, doing this surgically uh, through a centripetal pump. I think the key here is to understand that um, uh, early is better. Anticipating the need for these therapeutics upfront uh, can uh, uh, avoid permanent or difficult to reverse end organ damage like uh, hemolysis dependent renal injury. And if we try to learn patients going from ECMO to LVAD, um, not necessarily that the ECMO was utilized to rescue them from right heart failure, but just the concept of going in that stage of severity requiring ECMO to VAD. Uh, in this very good study by our, our Dr. De Filippis uh, in the Columbia group, we can see that H, BMI, serum creatinine, total bilirubin, and the need for an RVAD are all predictors of mortality. So I will say that the best thing that we can do is to avoid uh, an RVAD after LVAD uh, and anticipate the need for it uh, might um, uh, uh, help the team to best understand what's next. So in that context, again, uh, integrating invasive hemodynamics and right heart failure can help mitigate, mitigate post bad risk. Uh, I think uh, uh, having uh, strong considerations for uh, translating all the findings that uh, um, uh, can be obtained from a PA catheter becomes very important in order to optimize with hemodynamics like the one shown in this uh, uh, picture in which you have pretty much perfect hemodynamics going into the OR, and again, in that way, trying to prevent as much as possible right heart failure. The truth is that patients uh, don't uh, present with that hemodynamic profile, that patients don't really um, are elective uh, in the sense of uh, they all present to our doors as Intermax 4 or at Intermax even 3. Patients coming crashing and burning with advanced sky stages, hemometabolic shock, high inotrope vasoactives, uh, lung injury, and there's a need to optimize them, whether it's with PA catheter-guided therapy, in this case, a transvalvular pump, rehabilitation, nutrition, physical education, um, in the sense of uh, making sure that these patients are walking, eating, talking, sleeping for a while until they are able to undergo the surgery. Uh, for that, I think I, that has become an important cohort to study longitudinal and how can we reverse or halting these maximal sky stages into a more stable situation going into replacement or heart replacement therapies. Again, going from ECMO to VAD uh, uh, has been shown in multiple uh, uh, registries that there are substantial considerations to make. 
Um, I think Dr. Syed uh, uh, from Germany have uh, also described mortality predictors of concern, which again, age, BMI, surrogates of abnormal liver function, female gender, lactate, atrial fibrillation, history of previous surgery, who have an increased risk from going from ECMO uh, to that. It doesn't mean that ECMO is a therapy that should not be utilized. It doesn't mean that ECMO is a bad thing to consider in patients that need it. It's just that we need to understand and lay the expectations that these patients will be at a much higher risk of perhaps right heart dysfunction since the ECMO in itself is supporting the right heart to begin with. So these um, uh, patients that present on advanced sky stages that require an ECMO with LV venting and that then require a transition from ECMO to a surgical transvalvular pump and then to heart rate three become uh, complex, but again, uh, uh, in the right setting with the right team, um, uh, very, uh, 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 you know, challenging, but at the same time, uh, with a with the right team approach, uh, uh, have the ability to transition them uh, to durable uh, uh, therapies without um, uh, significant uh, co comorbidities or normal or adverse outcomes. So, in conclusion, uh, the uh, spectrum of right heart failure is longitudinal. Uh, Restratification of right heart function after uh, ELVA requires integration of clinical, hemodynamic, and imaging. Profiling Intermax 1 cohorts further, such as uh, 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 advanced sky stages and how they transition to durable VADs might help with optimization of the failing left, left heart prior to durable VAD. And I think uh, interdisciplinary situational awareness of the right heart unit function across the continuum of care might help reduce the burden of right heart function after durable VAD. Thank you. Thanks, Jaime. A few questions come to mind, but we'll just take the first one that's in the chat, um, which is, is there an optimal heart rate range for RV in post-LVAD RV failure? Patients are often paced at 90 to 100, which seems too high. So what's your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think that has been sort of a myth that we have uh, tried to <laughs> change with, uh, um, again, these patients uh, coming out uh, under PA catheter guided therapy, we we don't routinely uh, need to pace them at, at high uh, at high rates. I think there's something to be said about uh, uh, the need for diastolic filling time. And uh, again, I think it's uh, uh, making sure that if there's going to be changes made for us, we don't have any problems going between 80 uh, to 90. Um, um, I think less than 80. I haven't seen it or haven't adjusted any pacemaker dependent patient to less than 80, but I don't think we need to go, uh, or I don't think that the um, progression of these patients after durable elbow is really depending on, on the heart rate in itself at all, but it's more in the management of afterload, pump speed, optimization, um, and uh, decongestion after OR. Uh, and, and again, uh, a, a lot of these factors uh, involve how uh, tough was the operation, how much they're bleeding, and all the dynamics that that entail. Very good. Well, I mean, uh, if you could stop sharing your screen, sorry. So yeah. we can move on to the next speaker, thanks. I think uh, in the interest of time, we will move on. And it's my true pleasure to introduce uh, one of the smartest people I know, and certainly an expert in the RV and pulmonary hypertension, Dr. Jean-Luc Vacheret from uh, Belgium. Uh, Jean-Luc is going to talk to us on the, the RV in crisis strategies in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Thanks for being with us, Jean-Luc. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, for this uh, very nice introduction. I'm not the smartest person you know. Uh, you know much smarter people than, than, than I am. Well, so, Dr. Kataria, um, than you. <laughs> okay, so uh, financial disclosures here. Yeah, the situation I'm talking about is fairly different from the one that has been uh, presented before because in pulmonary arterial hypertension, the RV is already a little bit uh, a train to an increase in afterload. So the chronic response to uh, the, the of the right ventricle to an increased afterload is first to increase its contractility uh, to keep the coupling between 
between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery affected. So first event is increasing contractility. Then when the disease evolves and when pulmonary hypertension remains, the right ventricle tends to dilate. This is the second effect. And then you could st you start seeing uncoupling of the RV to the pulmonary to the pulmonary artery. And this is very, very much what is really the cause of the disease. But bear in mind that the first response is always an increase in contractility, fairly different from the situation of what we see in, uh, uh, in heart failure. Of course, you can have an acute right ventricular failure or about or flare of pulmonary hypertension that would lead to acute decompensation or acute RV failure. In the context of pulmonary hypertension, you will have two different mechanisms. One is systolic dysfunction with an increased wall tension, increased oxygen demand, RV ischemia, decreased coronary perfusion, and potentially arrhythmias that are going to uh, potentially increase the dysfunction of the right ventricle. On the other side, the acute on chronic, because there's already RV pressure over overload, you will start seeing diastolic dysfunction, more RV dilation, tricuspid regurg, pulmonary regurgitation, leading to afterload that is witnessed by an increase in right atrial and central venous pressure. This is, of course, leading to systemic congestion and organ dysfunction. This is probably more, more the, the, the things we see in patients who are mildly uh, impaired with a mildly impaired right ventricular failure at the very end stage of their disease. But of course, systolic dysfunction is also, and ischemia is also associated to a decrease in RV output, leading to LV, RV to LV interdependency that is going to be further disturbed by the presence of overload. So altogether, it starts with a right heart, but it ends with a decrease in left ventricular preload, decrease in cardiac output, and potentially hypertension and shock. So this is, in a nutshell, what is happening when you have an acute failure of a chronically trained right ventricular to cope with an increase in pressure. Now, when you look at the outcome of our patients with PH getting in the uh, inter intensive care unit or getting into acute pulmonary hypertension or acute uh, RV failure. This is a slide that I borrowed from Laurent Saval showing that the intra-hospital mortality, irrespective of the group that you're referring to or the cause of admission, mainly it's right heart failure, the intra-hospital mortality is very high. It's about 30 to 40 percent. Three months mortality can be as high as 50 percent. Interestingly enough, and it comes back to one of the questions I was asked in the, in the chat, to, to, to whether it was because it was directly due to pulmonary hypertension or to some other factors. In fact, most of the factors that are associated with mortality are independent of pulmonary hypertension, but are associated with the um, consequences of every failure, and this is clearly um, a decreased renal function or acute renal failure dialysis or systemic hypotension. So these are clearly the, one, the, the reasons why patients are um, having a high mortality rate when they're getting in the, um, in the ICU. If you look at the causes of acute RV failure in the context of pH, in most cases, there's a triggering factor. Uh, that triggering factor can be an acute change in volume status, whether it's fluid overload or hypovolemia. It can be higher demand. Anemia is one of the causes of RV failure in pH. Pregnancy is a dreadful situation that we have to deal with, unfortunately, from time to time. But also you have other more common causes like sepsis, arrhythmias, or acute hypoxemia. And in a very small number of cases, you may have PAH therapy withdrawal. This is more something we see in patients who are treated with intravenous prostacyclines. Um, one of the causes also of RV, acute RV failure in patients with PH is surgery, whether it's planned surgery or emergency surgery. I don't want to, to uh, spend too much time on it. There's a very great paper or consensus document from the uh, uh, from um, several groups at ICHLT, including the PVD IDN, looking at the management of those patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure undergoing surgery. It's a great document in which you will find a lot of resources for helping you to find, um, I mean, to set up protocols at your uh, individual institutions. Now, if I'm back to my patients with right heart failure in the context of pH, this is something that 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 is seems kind kind of bold because you have like the basic monitoring uh, support that you need in the ICU. I just want to point out that a right heart cath in the context of PAH is 
optional. It's not mandatory. It's only interesting if you want to get a comprehensive hemodynamic assessment because you have a doubt in terms of diagnosis or because you have a very complex or severe situation. But you don't necessarily have to show a Ranz catheter in all patients with pH that are presenting in the intensive care unit. Now, there are some simple rules to uh, uh, manage severe pH in the ICU, and I'm going to review them with you. The first is treating triggering factor uh, factors, providing ICU care. So treat arrhythmias, treat infection, uh, ensure that the patient has enough oxygen to uh, have a saturation above 90%. As much as you can, avoiding intubation is something very important. There are relationships with uh, that are well known between mechanical ventilation and risk of death in patients who are um, uh, suffering from pH, especially when you impose a PEEP, a positive pressure in the lungs that have had an impact, of course, on the cardiac function. Optimization of fluid balance is, is fundamental. If you have hypovolemia, you can do a cautious fluid challenge. If you have fluid overload, IV diuretics are good. A renal replacement therapy or ultrafiltration is good. But remember, uh, I've, I've never seen a patient with pH dying because he's receiving or she's receiving 20 milligrams of furosemide, and sometimes it's that much that you need to have the patient being unloaded. Maintain systemic blood pressure. A treatment of choice would be norepinephrine. This is what is recommended currently um, in, um, um, when you want to use a vasopressor. Optimization of cardiac output is also extremely important. We would prefer the butamine uh, to keep the, um, the cardiac index above 2.5 uh, or to keep SVO2 above 60%. We tend to uh, recommend to avoid inodilators or PD3 inhibitors because of the risk of systemic hypertension and hence the, this vicious, vicious cycle, cycle sorry, of decrease um, a coronary perfusion, uh, right ventricular ischemia, and secondary drop in cardiac output. And finally, um, reduction, reduction sorry, of RV after load is something important. Um, if your patient is all, not already treated, consider IV hypoprostenol as the treatment of choice in those patients who are falling off the cliff. Sometimes you can use temporarily uh, IV hypoprostenol in a patient with pH, and that's the case, for example, in um, emergency delivery during a pregnancy, and then wean off your patient if you ensure stability uh, when right, but acute right heart failure is uh, being treated. In our uh, last set of guidelines, we have a nice chapter on the management, the, the emergency management, but also uh, from the World Symposium, there's a full article that was led uh, with a task force that was led by Mars Hopper. And I just want to re-insist and re-emphasize again that um, when we need an inotrope, the butamine is preferred. This is the drug for which we have the largest uh, amount of data and clinical use. And if you want to use a vasopressor, norepinephrine is, is surely your uh, drug of choice. Now, after those five steps, and I've tried to find a cool acronym to, to, to summarize them, and I, I was not able to do that. So any suggestion are welcome. Uh, but once you've tried to, when, when, once you've done your basic work, you need to consider whether the patient in right heart failure may be considered for lung transplantation. And this is very important because in case of insufficient response, you need to make the decision whether to move on to awake ECMO or extracorporeal uh, uh, life support or just to provide best supportive care because your patient is not a candidate for transplant. So either this has been um, assessed prior to the compensation or in the newly uh, patients presenting newly in the ICU with heart, right heart failure and pH, you need to assess whether there's a chance that this specific patient may be a candidate for lung transplantation. If this is the case, then, the case, then ECMO and uh, ECLS devices may be considered. And again, this is coming from Mario's work uh, in the ERG after the World Symposium, summarizing the experience we have with uh, ECMO. And you see that it's mo most of the case is VA ECMO that, that is used. The bridge to transplant can be successful from two thirds to 100% of the case. And um, even two thirds of the patient may eventually be discharged from the hospital following transplantation. So the success of ECMO uh, in the context of supporting a patient or, or a failing RV in pH as a bridge to transplant is a successful bridge. And I recall my younger years in the ICU, ECMO was considered as, as, as the devil uh, to avoid at any cost. It's exactly the opposite right now. In a patient with pH, you need to prepare to put this patient on ECMO in case of failure of the right ventricle. 
to choice. In most cases, would be VA ECMO, which is the most widely used. P PALA approach may be considered uh, if there is a longer support of time that is expected. Of course, the choice is going to be depending on center's experience, but again, VA ECMO surely rocks in this context. The timing. Uh, is important. You should not uh, consider uh, the the uh, uh, the support when the patient is at end stage with end organ damage. And if you believe that there will be a poor outcome, for example, if uh, uh, the patient already is in uh, acute renal failure, we also know that following CPR, ECMO is not that that successful. So you might consider using ECMO after CPR with with, with a great level of caution, um, especially uh, with the the assessment of potential brain damage before moving on to transplant. And then transplantation, of course, is important. That's the next step. It's, a, it's, clearly, it's clearly an established strategy as a bridge to transplant. And there's, uh, um, I think, an important point is to be sure that in your transplant, lung transplant program, you also have a, a, um, an ECMO team to support you and to help you bringing your patient uh, safely to, to transplantation. Speaking of which, you have a list here of um, two very important timings when you talk about transplant. It's time to referral and time to listing, which are two different approaches. Time to referral is when you believe that your patients start to fall off the cliff progressively, is at full speed, uh, appropriate pH therapy, still has complaints or has um, uh, worrying symptoms such as recurrent hemoptysis, that patient should be referred to a, a transplant center. Timing for listing, of course, you need to have full evaluation. You need to have a high reveal score on tree or, or ESC ERS high score uh, under appropriate treatment. That should include parenteral prostacycline. This is the case, at least at our center and, and in many centers in Europe. Then, of course, consider transplant as an emergency in case of right acute heart rate failure, hemoptysis, and uh, uh, rapid but not in stage and organ damage. So that's the end of the story in many patients is, in, is transplantation. Now, let me close by sharing with you um, um, a, a couple of thoughts that are summarized by a great mentor, uh, at least to me, this, these are Master Yoda's words of wisdom. When you deal with RV failure in pH, no RVPA physiology you must. Identify a triggering factor you will, and unloading the RV you fate will be. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Those were uh, some fantastic talks. Um, we're over the hour, so I guess with this, we'll end the webinar. Um, really grateful to all the speakers and to my co-chair, Dr. Tedford. Um, see you at the next webinar. <laughs>